from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, I was afraid you might be away for the weekend. Who's that? Byron Kane, at Intercoastal Maritime and Life. Oh, hello, Byron. How are things in Boston? In Boston, fine. In Cod Harbor, terrible. Who's this? Meg McCarthy, who runs an eating place there at the harbor. Murder, mayhem, arson, or what? Right now, it's or what. But if you don't do something, and fast, it may be all three... Can you come over and see me? Now, bye? I know it's Saturday afternoon, Johnny, but this needs fast action, will you? Bye. Goodbye. No, bye. Listen, you... Dolly, you're a sucker. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cod Harbor, Massachusetts. To the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company. Following is an accounting of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Meg's Palace matter. Expense account item one, $7.30. Cab from my apartment, train fare and incidentals to Boston. Byron Kay was a good insurance broker, and I figured he wouldn't have called me over a weekend unless it was pretty important. Get right to the point, Johnny. Insurance on the palace is only for $15,000. Wait a minute, Bye. What is this palace? A fishing boat? No, it's what Meg McCarthy calls her restaurant right down on the dock. Cod Harvey, you say? That's right. Well, what seems to be the trouble over there that couldn't wait till after the weekend? Well, like I told you, this character, Meg McCarthy, runs a so-called restaurant down on the docks, the palace. I sold her 15000 insurance on it. And, Johnny, it's uh, quite a place. What do you mean by that? Uh... We also carry 25,000 straight life insurance on Meg herself. Separate policy, of course. Which one are you worried about, by? Both, I think. Huh? Matter of fact, the more I think about it, the gladder I am that she didn't fall from my pitch when I tried to get her to increase the coverage on the cafe. If she had, our necks would really be out. Well, what's the matter? Isn't it worth 15,000 now? Oh, sure, at least. Even if it doesn't look it. You know, the stoves, equipment, and all that sort of stuff are in the coverage, too. Then I'm afraid I don't see what you... The thing is this, Johnny. Meg has been threatened... By whom? How? Who knows? Anyhow, she's notified me that there have been a couple of attempts to set fire to her place. Since she lives upstairs in it, that means danger to her own life, too. Uh-huh. And the whole 40000 is at stake. Yes. Will you go up there right away and see what you can do? Today? Tomorrow? Sunday? Look, maybe you can get in some fishing. I understand you're quite a fisherman. Oh, now, the last three times I was promised fishing while working on a case, all I did was cut bait. Proposition. If you don't get in at least a full day's fishing trip while you're up there... I'll double whatever you line up on your expense account. Uh, sounds mighty tempting. How about it, Johnny? Okay, bye. You asked for it. <laughs> Item 2, 1195, transportation back to Hartford, then on to Cod Harbor the next morning. Fine way to spend a nice warm Sunday. Nice place, too, if you lost your sense of smell. There were two or three dozen fishing boats of all shapes and sizes tied up at the long dock and piers that comprised the important part of the village. For housing, there was a scattering of weather-beaten shacks, one store. Meg's Palace turned out to be the biggest, most disreputable looking of the dockside eating places, and since there was a closed sign on the front door, I went around to the back. Did I tell you to drop the clean scrub floor in my lovely joint of water is facing below? I'm what? sick and tired of looking at that whole No, 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 look here, Meg. I, I just come back to apologize uh-huh. for uh-huh. But well, the next time that mangy, scurvy crew of the Lily Ann comes in here and gets drunk and brawls and carries on and busts up me fine glassware in China to say nothing of a couple no, of wooden mate, chairs and a fine Listen thing. to me, darling. Don't no, you, darling, me, you pig face squint No, oh, Meg, put down the frying pan. No, oh, sir, not until you get your filthy hide out of here. I'm running a respectable joint, and the likes of you and the ragtail crew of yours have got no place in it. But, uh, What's more, and furthermore, I won't have you around. But hey, I, you. I only so come get. to pay for the damage my boys did last night. Now, who hey, cares? that's a laugh. Pay for the loss of me dignity to say nothing of me Next trade. You little buttercup, please. Now, get out of here, Willie. Get out. Okay. Hey, here's your here's your money, man. Who wants your dirty, offensible money? Get! Man, put down the frying pan. I'll put it down, Willie boy, if you don't get out of here. Oh, man, 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 oh, no. Get now before I use the oh, man, Get out of here! Get out of here! 
I, uh... Excuse me, Miss McCarthy. Oh, ain't he a darling? Ain't he the sweetest man you ever did see? Huh? The man you just threw out of here? Not only comes in to apologize, but brings the money to pay for the damage his pranking boys done last night when they were celebrating the big catch they made. Lovely bunch of lads they are, too, every one of them. As loyal to Willie, but... Now, who the devil are you? And what's the big idea of barging in here on a Sunday when anybody with eyes in his stupid head can see that the place is closed oh, up? Oh, no, your eyes so blind in your head you couldn't see the sign out front. I saw And it. sneaking in here the back way this way. Who do you think you are? Well, I wasn't Now sneaking. get out and leave a lady alone of a Sunday. Go on. Don't get tough with me, Meg McCarthy. Huh? Just put down that pot and shut up for a minute while I tell you why I'm here. Put it down. Shades of me, dear departed, overbearing husband. Yes, sir. After all, I should have noticed you're a gent standing by the way you done while me and Bill was at its helter and skelter. Oh, but he's a dear one, ain't he? Yeah, well, at this point, I wouldn't know. But from what I saw a minute ago... Oh, don't let that fool you, dearie. We're in love, me and Willie boy. Ain't he a living doll? Meg. A fine, fine husband. He's going to make me too. That's why I made him the beneficiary of my life insurance policy. That's exactly what I want to talk to you about. Then go ahead and talk. What's stopping you standing there like a banty rooster that doesn't know... Will you yet? shut up? Oh, well, of course I will, dearie. And I'm begging your humble pardon. But if there's anything I hate, it's a lily-livered man that has... Meg! Had... Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Then listen. Yes, sir. My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Insurance investigator, eh? Well, in spite and despite of your pretty clothes and pleasing and manner, I don't want any of already got... No, that. no, you don't understand, I've Meg. got all I can have. I'm little. just... And from the looks of things, these past couple of... Will you of shut the... up a minute? Of course, dearie. I'm sorry. You call the insurance company, Mr. Byron Kay, an intercoastal oh, maritime. yes, dear little pasty-faced Byron boy. Why, do you know if he'd had half the guts and get of a he-man, he would have sold me twice the insurance he did? Well, that's not quite the way he told it to me. Well, you... it's the way I'm telling it to you. Oh, what am I going to do, darling, if they wreck my place the way they're trying? Oh, this Willie boy, as you call him, who was just in here? That's a feminine. What? He's Captain Billy Morgan. Bill to you and any man what calls him Oh, Willie. put it down, will you? And stop yapping your head off and answer my question. Yes, sir. Now, is Captain Bill Morgan one of the people you suspect of trying to wreck this ugly-looking hash house? Oh, I love you, boy. You talk like a real sweet, overbearing maid. Then answer my question. Well, of course he ain't. Willie boy wouldn't hurt me any more than I'd touch a hair of his pretty head if he had a hair on top of it. All right, then who? Danny boy, there's a dozen of them like to see Meg's palace burn to the ground. Blast the black even so. Why? Because I give them the best and the most food in the harbor. That's what the man gets here. So what happens to the silver plate in Ernie's manor house and Irving's chop suey joint? Well, I'm putting them out of business, that's what. So you think they're trying to put you out of business? Think it, I know it. So I telephoned that sniveling, lop-eared Byron K to send somebody down here and make them stop it before he had to pay off a lot of insurance on it and maybe even on me. Why else do you think? There have been some attempts to set the place on fire, I understand. Why else do you think a lady like myself would take to sleeping on the bar down here every night, getting a creek and me sacred lily up? But I'm getting sick and fed up with it. I don't know that I blame you. Now, look, this will you... This trying to keep awake all night every night to keep them from burning it out from under me and me, whether it is making a fair shadow of me for myself out of me, I'm losing me strength. But that's your I... aim. Look, while we talk, I'll help you clear up some of this. Where's mess. the devil you will? It's not the man's job, especially since you ain't romantically inclined towards me. But you would let Bill Morgan clean up for you, huh? Well, he was the cause of it, wasn't he? So if he and his boys don't show up before nightfall and take care of it, so help me, I'll keel haul them every one. Besides, if he's going to be me old man when the fishing season's done, he's got to know how to keep in line. Now. Now. You say there are people you suspect are trying to fire this building. Three. All right, three. Now, who are they? The owners of the other restaurants here on the dock? All right. First, there's Clem Harris, what runs the silver plate. Oh, and a sly one he is. Yeah, what do you mean? He's too soft and polite and soft spoke. Me, I never trust a man unless he talks up like a man. Yeah, I guess that's why I like you, dear. Uh -huh. Well, who are the others? 
Ernie Turner at the Manor House Cafe. Oh, yeah. Is that the big place down at the other end? Of... <laughs> The little hole in the wall next to the bait stand. And half the time the customers don't know whether they're getting bad food or thawed out bait. And the third one. Yeah? Huh? It's that stubborn mule that runs Irving's chop suey joint. Irving who? What's his last name? Irving? His name's Tony. His name... Now, wait a minute, will you please? Sure. Tony Fortino, Italian. Then why is it called... Why a chop suey place? If anybody has eyes, he would have saw how the sign was changed. First, the Chinese had it with chop suey. Yeah. Then came Irving with kosher, so he added his name to it, and now it's Tony. Well, then why... Only there wasn't any more room left on the sign, so stop complaining. <sighs> okay, Meg, you win. But have you any specific reason to suspect any one of them? One of them? I suspect them all, the dirty conniving. Why? Because they're a dirty conniving... I'll tell you why. Because they won't sell out to me. Because oh. they all three keep open competing with me, and that's three against one, so they're a dirty all right, conniving. All right, you but... said that. Well, aren't they? How would all you... All right. Think? Yes, sir. I, uh... I love it when you speak to me that way, Johnny. Boy. So you said. Now, I asked you if you have any specific reason for suspecting any one or all of them. Well, of course I have, on account of the threats they sent. How do you know they sent them? Because I suspect them, that's why. And what happens three times they try to set fire to my lock? Meg, Meg, you don't have one bit of actual evidence against any of them, do you? Well... Well, do you? No. But I suspect the dirty kid Hold it, please. Are you sure those fires weren't accidental? Accidental? Well, with all the dirt and grease you leave around this shack. In the middle of the night with a stove fire banked like I've been doing it for 20 years and with all the fires starting outside where they have no business. Look, Johnny boy, I'll show you where they started outside. Well, now, that's a good idea because so far I confess I can't get very much alarmed over what's happened. Now, who... Don't the whole town know I'm closed on Sundays? Hello, and what kind of a blubber-headed income poop would be calling Meg's Palace on a Sunday when everybody knows... I Johnny Dollar. Huh? Oh, of course. The gentleman's right here. It's for you, Johnny boy. Oh? Hello, Johnny Dollar. We know why you're here, Dollar. Oh, yeah? Who's we? But you won't be here long, understand? Well, now, that's a matter of opinion, isn't it? Either you go quiet the way you came, or you go in a long wooden box. Get it? What is it, Johnny boy? Come on, Meg. Let's get to work. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, well, they say that darkness can cover a multitude of sins. It can also cover a strong man armed with a deadly weapon. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Byron Kay in Boston, Johnny. Hi. The operator had quite a time locating you. I don't see why I'm in the only available room for rent here in Cod Harbor. Huh? Well, she said...
said she was ringing Meg's Palace Restaurant. That's where I am. Room's right above the place. Well, tell me, have you found out whether it's true somebody's trying to burn up that joint and put Meg out of business? Not only that, Bly, but whoever's behind the attempts to get her out of the way has threatened to get me. Hey. Hey, you want some help? Yeah. Yeah, I want you to send me something by truck as soon as possible. Huh? And I want to be sure it arrives here quietly at night so that nobody in this little fishing village knows it arrives. Holy smoke, what? Listen carefully, Bly, and I'll tell you. I want you to send me six lines. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cod Harbor, Massachusetts... To the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Boston. Assignment, the Meg's Palace matter. Expense account continued. Expense account item, well, since you're paying for and sending that batch of fire extinguishers, Byron, I can hardly charge them to my expense account, can I? But I have a sneaking suspicion they might be mighty important. A cursory inspection of this tiny fishing community has revealed no sign of a firehouse. Nothing, in fact, but some hose connections for cleaning off the docks. And after the threats Meg McCarthy has received, plus a couple of attempts to fire up this disreputable-looking establishment of hers, well, I guess I still have some Boy Scout blood in my veins. In view of the threat to me, I figured it might be a good idea to consult the local authorities. I learned a long time ago that it's a good plan to enlist their cooperation when working in a strange small community. Inquiries from some of the fishermen mending their nets spread out in the long wharf led me to a small, shabby, unmarked frame shack that stood about a block away from the waterfront. Hey, come in, come in. Mr. Beasley? That's right. Well, what's your name? Johnny Dollar. Dollar, huh? Okay, what do you want? Well, uh, you're the chief of police, I understand. Acting chief of police? Oh. Acting mayor, too, an acting judge, acting town clerk, acting just about anything else you could want. <laughs> I don't get it. Well, I don't know why not. Officially, I guess Cod Harbor is just a part of Barnesboro, a couple of miles inland. We're so small, and we're not incorporated like most towns, so we just have to be kind of self-sufficient under ourselves. You see what I mean? And you know something? It works out pretty good. Yeah, well, I guess it's as chief, uh, as acting chief of police that I've come to see you. Yeah, what about? The Meg's Palace Cafe. Ah, you mean you take any stock in Meg's talk about somebody threatening to burn up that cockroach-loaded dump she calls a restaurant? I'm representing the insurance company that holds $15,000 insurance on it. Never come to your mind, Mr. Dollar, that Meg, her own self, might have set the fires to collect that insurance? And call for help as a cover-up? Yeah, yeah, the thought has entered my mind. Just crazy enough to do a thing like that, too. Hasn't she been to you for help? She told me. Oh, what sort of evidence, one way or another, have you turned up? Dollar, I haven't looked for any. Yeah, what? The less I meddle in their affairs, the less trouble I'll have with the folks here in Cod Harbor. Oh, hey, now, wait a minute. For a mayor and police chief and so on, you don't seem to be very concerned about these people of yours. So maybe I'm not. What's the difference? Well, look here, if you... Yeah, you know, unless something serious happened, like a murder or... Or, or a fire that destroyed Meg's palace and maybe half the docks. Don't you think that sort of thing is serious? Well, yeah, if it happens. Then I'd probably have to call in the regular appointed authorities over to Barnesboro. But there hasn't been any fire yet. Not any real one. So why get your dander up? Well, I'll be. Look, with so little concern about the place, how did you ever get all those jobs? <laughs> Easy. Lost my school route on the banks last fall. So for want of something better, I just took it. You took them all. Why not? The town feeds and bores me, and I like it. So... Real soft, lazy, good-for-nothing life, huh? Sure. Now, why don't you be a good boy, Dollar, and leave things be around here? Stop wasting my time. Well, just let me take enough of your valuable time to ask a couple of questions. Sure. Go ahead. No harm in asking. I want to know about some of the people here in Cod Harbor. Like who? Clem Harris, for one. Careful, boy. That's my cousin. Oh. Who else? Ernie Turner and Tony Fortino. Oh. 
On account of them's the three that run the other dirty bites along the dock, huh? Yeah. I'd like a rundown on all three of them. Easy. Yeah? Yeah. Go talk to them. Oh, now, wait a minute. The easiest you're... way I know of for you to find out all about them. Well, you're a lot of help. Dollar, like I said, we're kind of self-sufficient under ourselves around here. We like it that way. And that's just another way of saying we don't like strangers coming here and messing around in our affairs. Well, that was pretty definitely that. It was getting quite late, and I decided I'd better postpone any interviews with Meg's business rivals until the following morning. Besides, as I walked along the wharf, I noticed that they were closed. Then I remembered somebody else I wanted to talk to, the beneficiary of Meg McCarthy's life insurance policy, the master of the fishing boat, Lily Ann, Captain Billy Morgan. But the Lily Ann, tied up at her berth, was dark and empty. Well, if anyone knew where Captain Billy was, it'd be Meg herself. So I walked the boards back to Meg's palace. What greeted me as I opened the back door of the place was truly a sight to behold. Over there with a hole, you stumble and lovingly. Over there in the corner, can you see? What's the matter with you, bleak and eyeball? Standing in the center of the floor, brandishing a moth eaten feather duster as if it were a club, stood Captain Billy Morgan, shouting orders to three men who were cleaning up the mess of pots and pans and broken crockery. Left over from Meg McCarthy's temper tantrum a short while earlier, when she belabored this same Captain Billy for a little celebration he and his crew had had in their place the night before. Belabored? It looked like she must have thrown one of everything in the joint at him. Bill! Hey, Captain Billy! Hey! Hey! Ah! Oh! Oh, it's you, huh? I uh, seen you here earlier today when Meg threw me out. Well, looks to me like you weren't all she threw. Yes, sir. Oh, she's a living dog. Hey, see, ain't you the insurance hand? She telephoned to help her find out who's trying to burn her out of here. Her uh, name's uh, Johnny Dollar, ain't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And Captain, I'd like to ask you a favor. Charlie, you yellow-bellied, bug-eyed, bandy-wasted. Don't throw that crash in the corner. What's the matter with you? Sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I guess the boys don't like working at night when they got to be up and aboard Little Ann and headed out for the fishing banks by 3 a.m. in the morning. Don't blame them. We couldn't leave Meg's place in a mess like this, now, could we? After all, uh, she's going to have to serve us coffee and sinkers before we go. Where is she? Upstairs. Has been for the last hour. In her room? Uh, in that room she's renting out to you. Figured like maybe you could stand some cleaning up and debugging, I guess. You know something? <laughs> she figured right. I'll ask her with the mop all ear. I'll ring it around your bloody neck. And swab off them tables while you're at it. Can't you see the mess you left on them? Oh, what can I do for you, Mr. Dollar? Well, look, why don't you and I go into the kitchen, Captain, where we can hear ourselves think? Well, sure, why not? All right, now you keep at it, you sow belly long tail. And if the joint ain't clean and tidy when I come back, I'll blast you all over the lease supper. <laughs> Real fine bunch of boys I got there, ain't they? I'll bite, are they? You bet your sweet living life they are. Finest crew on any boat in the harbor. Charlie Oley and Montgomery. Now, uh, what was it you wanted, Mr. Dollar? You found out anything about who's causing all the worries to my lover girl? Not very much, yet. Well, I hope you do. Do you? Huh? I don't get you. I'm going to be honest with you. Lay all the cards right on the table. Well, that's the only way, I always say. All right. I'm just as concerned about Meg herself as I am about this cafe. Sure you are. Me too. Now, whether you like it or not, I have to consider the fact that you are the beneficiary of Meg's $25,000 life insurance policy. If anything were to happen to her... Why, sure, I see what you mean. You bet your life I see what you mean. Why, you blasted, land-loving son of a dirty right, yellow scum. Take it easy, Captain. Take, take it, it easy. easy. You Pipe tried down. to say I hurt one single hair, Meg McCut. Dollar, you may crash like that. I'll swab the decks with that ornery hide of yours and feed you. Put him up. Put him up, Dollar. You want to talk to me like I that? I said you put pipe him up. down, Captain. Let's talk sense a minute. Talk sense, yeah, but don't you go implicating it. I didn't imply a thing yet. Well, I warn you, you just don't. Just a minute, then, Captain Billy Morgan. Oh, oh, just oh, a Meg, minute. I, uh, Who do you think you're talking to like that, the guest of me humble establishment? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, Meg, darling, but he and was talking And why ain't like you that. in there headed from those poor boys of yours with the cleaning up? Well, we, but they, they're almost finished up, Meg, me darling. Besides, but, unless you are, we get out of here and get your sleep. You'll not be worth your salt on the boat tomorrow. Meg, I'd like I... to talk to Captain Billy. Tomorrow. 
Go off in the boat with him in the morning, and you'll all have plenty of time to talk. Well, I want to talk Willie to him now. Willie, boy, get uh, out we'll with them. Go on. Well, yes, my dear. And, uh, I'll see you at the dock at three in the morning. Well, now, wait a minute. Get, get, I... Joe! I'll so, Johnny, boy, you go out with him. It'll give me a chance to fix your room up real nice for you, like it should be for a gentleman <laughs> like yourself. Okay, Meg. Come to think of it, I was promised a fishing trip on this case. Anyways, I'll not be worrying about any fires tonight with you staying here. So if you don't mind, I'll retire to my bed and see you at breakfast time. Okay. Maybe I can help Billy's crew finish cleaning up in there. Oh, don't you lift a finger. It was a twilly boy I thought them plates and things so him and his crew can clean it up. Good night, Johnny boy. There's food in the icebox and your beds are made when you're ready to retire. I stood there for a moment, smiling after her. Then I decided I'd take her advice, that instead of helping the men clean up the cafe, I'd get a breath of fresh air before hitting the sack. The moon was just a thin sliver in the eastern sky, and the stars twinkled merrily in the broad, clear expanse overhead. The cottages of the peaceful little fishing village were dark. Along the docks at the waterfront, the fishing boats playfully nudged each other as they slowly and quietly swung and rolled on the gently heaving water. Their mass and rigging formed an intricate, ever-changing pattern against the occasional beam from the lighthouse and the point as it lazily swept across the night. Somewhere, far out on the landward breeze, an occasional seabird called. It was all so peaceful and serene that I couldn't help wondering how trouble could ever come to a... Then I saw it. A slight movement at the front corner of the old building. A silhouette hunched over, tensely watching the front door, waiting. But waiting for whom? Slowly, as quietly as possible, I crept up on whoever it was, hoping in the dim light to recognize him or her before I was discovered. Softly, I passed the side door. I could still hear the members of the crew inside at their work. But in my concentration on the person out front, I was too slow in my reaction when that side door suddenly opened behind me. Huh? What? Who are you? Oh, no, you... Oh... Very suddenly, it got very dark. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a trip to sea on the Lily Ann that starts out like an ordinary fishing trip. But somewhere on board lurks a man with murder in his heart. And his next intended victim, me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Gemstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Hmm. Dollar. Oh. oh, listen, it's after midnight, and I don't feel Mr. so good. Mr. Tim Beasley, I want to talk to you. Oh, 
the oh-so-very-uncooperative mayor, chief of police, and general do nothing in this town. Now, just a minute. Now, you just a minute. I asked you for help this afternoon in finding out who's threatening to put Meg McCarthy in a restaurant out of business. Dollar. What do I get? A snide warning from you that the people of Cod Harbor don't want outsiders messing in their affairs. Well, I don't believe it. If you'll only listen to me, I want to help Then why you. weren't you here a little while ago when somebody slugged me? I was. What? Who do you think picked you up in that alley and put you to bed at Meg's place? You? You want to come over here and talk to me now? I know it's late. Okay, Beasley. If my head stops spinning long enough, I'll be right over. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location, Cod Harbor, Massachusetts... To the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Boston. Assignment, the Meg's Palace matter. Expense account continued. Expense account? Well, so far here in Cod Harbor, there's been little need for it. Meg McCarthy had given me a small room above a restaurant and provided all the food I could eat. My own two feet were the only means of transportation. The only shops were along the waterfront, but they were suppliers to the boats tied up at the various docks. And a motley lot of boats they were. Some were big schooners dating back to the last century and still carrying sail. There were power boats of all shapes and sorts and sizes, from 18-footers with one-lung gasoline engines to big 60- and 70-foot diesel jobs. Trouble of the sort I'd come to investigate seemed out of place in this otherwise peaceful little village. Come in, Mr. Dollar. So, you've suffered a change of heart, huh, Beasley? And you've decided to go up with it. Yeah, that's about the best way to put it, I guess. See, it's now, this wait, way. wait, wait. Before we go any further, what was this bit about picking me up after I got socked on the head a while ago? Listen, Mr. Dollar, after you left here this afternoon, I got to thinking. Maybe I was wrong in giving you the back of my hand, and maybe you was right in walking out mad like you did. Well, how would you feel? The insurance company back in Hartford gets word from Meg McCarthy that somebody's threatening to burn up that joint on the waterfront she calls a restaurant. It's insured for $15,000, and she's insured for twenty five. I know, I know. Well, you see, it's this way... And when I get here, I learn that somebody has already tried a couple of times to set fire to the place. All right, all right. I learned a long time ago that in a case like this, it's smart to enlist the help of the local authorities. Here in Cod Harbor, those authorities all seem to boil down to you. Why, I will never know. Yeah, like I told you. But now listen... And what do I get from you? The cold shoulder, the back of your hand, as you put it. I, I, I got to explain to you, Mr. Dollar. Well, then go ahead and explain. And believe me, brother, it better be good. Well, there, there probably ain't another village like this in the whole country, see? Technically, oh, we're supposed to be part of Barnesboro, a few miles inland. But we've always left them alone, and they've always left us alone. Any trouble happens, we settle it amongst ourselves, and... Because we're such a small place, uh, it's get along with everybody or get out, see? So we just don't have no trouble. Um, not of any account, that is. Unless it's somebody comes in from outside and makes it for us. You understand, Mr. Dollar? Are you forgetting it was one of your own townspeople who asked me to come here and for her own protection? That's what I got to thinking about after you left. So I decided maybe I'd better talk to you. And, well, that's how I happened to go over to Meg's place tonight. Was that you I saw in the shadows out by the front door? Yes, sir. I, I was waiting for Captain Billy Morgan and his crew to finish cleaning up the place for Meg. And I was going to go in and talk to you. And that's the truth, Mr. Dollar. Come on. Well, I just got there when I heard a noise out at the side of the cafe like a fight. Of course, it was dark. There was no fight. Somebody came out the side door from behind me and knocked me on the head. Yeah. So I took you up and put you on your bed and gave you time to get your senses back and then telephone to you. Uh Uh-huh. You sure it was you out at the front of the cafe? Oh, no, Mr. Dolly. You trying to implicate maybe it was me that give you a belaying pin over the head? Was that what hit me, Beasley? A belaying pin? Well, 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 something hit you and I just... Okay, well, okay, I'll take your word it wasn't you for the time being. I swear, Mr. Dollar, by all... All the... right, then, listen. Yeah? I heard that side door open just before I started seeing stars. Huh? Yeah? That means whoever struck me must have come from inside the cafe. Say. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. The only people inside were Captain Morgan and the crew of his fishing boat. You sure? I'm sure, because I was in there myself just a minute before. Just Billy Morgan and his three men. Where was May? She'd gone up to bed. I just stepped outside for a breath of air. Oli? Huh? Oli Jensen, first mate. Yeah, I heard Captain Billy call one of them Oli. Well, his name's Jensen, huh? And then there's Charlie. Charlie Buttons, the deckhand, and Montgomery, the engineer. Well? No, no, not one of them could have done it. Isn't that like saying I didn't get hit? One of them must have done it. No, sir, Mr. Dollar, it just couldn't make any sense. All right, tell me this. Are any of them related to the guys who run the other cafes along the wharf? No, no. But you are, aren't you, Beasley? Huh? To Clem Harris at the Silver Plate, or is it the Greasy Plate? Anyway, he's your cousin, isn't he? I told you that. But if you think he had anything... All right, now, I don't know what I think. But let me tell you this. If you have suffered this big change of heart, it's about time you started proving it. I'll do anything you say, Mr. Dawn. All right. Meg seems to think the threats and attempts to burn down her place came from her competitors. Well, I know she does, but she... Now, in a couple of hours, I'm taking off of the fishing banks with Captain Morgan and his crew. Maybe I'll be able to spot which of his men laid me out in the alley, if it was one of them. Meantime, you see if you can dig up anything that would put a finger at the other cafe owners. That means Ernie at the manor house, Tony who runs Irving's chop suey joint, and your cousin, Clem Harris. Okay, Mr. Dollar, I'll do it. Hey, by the way... Did you ever check their handwriting against the letters Meg received? Well, no, I never quite got around to it. it I don't think you ever got around to doing anything. But it's such an easy job. Well, do it. Get... get the letters from Meg and check them. Yes, sir. I'm going to try to get a couple hours sleep before we take off on the Lily Ann. Yes, sir. The big lazy slob. The first time I met him, he'd actually boasted about his soft job. About how nicely he could live in the town without having to lift a finger. Oh, sure, the sudden change of heart may have been genuine, but I wouldn't have bet on it. And I still had no proof it wasn't he who slugged me. And one of Meg's rival eateries was run by his cousin. But then everything indicated that whoever struck me had come from inside her own cafe. So I decided it was more important than ever that I go on the next day's fishing trip. Back in my room on the second floor of Meg's palace, I fell asleep the minute my head hit the pillow. And I could have sworn it was only a second later that... Hmm. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, who is it? What is it? Time to get up and out. What do you think it is? Huh? Oh. Who else? Uh. You're going out with the boys. Just get them lazy bones of yours up out of that bed. Oh, but it's still pitch dark. Are you decent? Well, whether you are or whether you ain't, it's time you was up. Here's the light for you. Oh. Oh, turn the thing off. Now, yeah. here's some coffee. Take a saucer or two. It'll choke you. It's that strong, but it'll wait. <sighs> Johnny boy, what happened to you? Oh, just what it looks like. But your head... Somebody just got real friendly with a belaying pin right after you went to bed. They come up here and attacked it? No, no, it was outside. Out by the side oh, door. I'll kill whoever done that to you, Johnny boy. So help me, I'll find out who done that. I'll... Be sure you want to get up and go out to the banks. Maybe you No, no, I'll be all right. And I think it's pretty important I go out with Captain Billy and his boys. Because I have a sneaking suspicion one of them may have done this. Why, them dirty, conniving... Oh, no, Johnny, you must be wrong. Oh? Why, don't you know, darling, that's the finest crew of men in all of Cod Harbor. I'm not so sure. But then you... You mean you think one of them could also be behind trying to burn me down? And maybe me with it. You can be mighty sure I'm going to try to find out. Oh, Johnny boy, I pray that you're thinking wrong. Anyhow, if you're going with them, well, up and out with you. By the time you're in your clothes, I'll have some grits on the table for you. Eggs and pork chops and donuts and jam. I met the crew of the Lily Ann at that breakfast. Breakfast? Considering the amount of food set before them and the way they piled into it, you'd think those four men hadn't eaten for a month. And I must confess, there was nothing about them that looked like cause for suspicion. First it was Charlie, a tall, brown-eyed, husky young fellow, alert and pleasant with a sense of humor, and he was obviously liked by the others. Well, I don't know, Mr. Dollar. I think you just got to dreaming about some nice, pretty gal, and when you reached out and tried to grab her, you fell out of bed, and that's the way you got banged up. <laughs> Montgomery, a bit older, the man who was responsible for the engines on the boat. Gray-haired, lean, wiry, with narrow fingers that looked clumsy and somehow never made a clumsy move. Whose blue eyes looked straight at you when he spoke. Don't you believe it? 
Now, you can blow me down, Mr. Dollar, if that ain't the most dastardly thing I ever heard of here in Card Arbor. Now, you best stick close to us that you're friends whilst you're here. I said, friends are made McCarthy, be friends of us. Then Ollie Jensen, first mate, the oldest member of the crew. Quiet, calm, and efficient. The soft-spoken one. It's not for me to inquire why you're here, what business you're about, Mr. Dollar, and I don't. But I'm certain it's for the good. And any help that we can give you, you're welcome, sir. And I say the difference with all this chitter and chatter when there's fish at sea for you to catch, you lazy lunkers. Get up from that table and get to work. By the time the sun's up, the fish will all be out of your reach. <laughs> Within a few minutes, we cast off, and the Lily Ann put to sea. Slowly, the lights of the little village disappeared aft. The moon had gone down, and our only company out in the dark water was the twinkling stars and the occasional running lights from the other boats setting out for the fishing banks. Captain Billy Morgan stood at the wheel. Montgomery sat athwart the engine cover and occasionally made some slight adjustment or indicated a change of throttle to the captain. Young Charlie and Ollie made ready the two small boats and trot lines. For today, we'd go for codfish in the deep that lay along the edge of Taylor Banks. I stood alone up in the bows, looking over the curling wash as it scattered the myriad microscopic beings and gave a soft phosphorescent glow to the water gliding past. And I wondered. I wondered why there had to be trouble in this world, where honest labor by honest men could do so much more. Honest men? No. Not even among this crew. One of them had to be the man who'd attacked me was probably the one who had threatened to burn Meg McCarthy out of business. So, I'd better have at it. I'd better get back aft, talk with them, watch their every move, try somehow to trap one of them into saying something that would give them away. Or maybe, who knows, give all of them away. And above all, watch my step. It was a long way back to shore. And the darkness and the sound of the engines could all too easily cover up an untoward act by one of them. It did. Before I could lift my head, a powerful pair of arms had picked me up bodily and dropped me overside. In the brief moment that I remember, I felt the strong tug from the big propellers as the water closed over me. Then a terrible blow against my side. Then nothing. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the motives for arson and murder begin to take definite shape in the form of a confession. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Lionel Champion here, Mr. Dollar. Who? I'm surprised Meg McCarty didn't answer. I ordered her to keep you in bed there at her place until I could see you again. I am in bed. And I take it you're the doctor who bandaged me up this way, put on this splint. That's right. After I tangled with a propeller at Captain Morgan's fishing boat this morning. Yes, only it was yesterday. Huh? You were unconscious when the captain and his men brought you in. 
After treating you, I gave you sedation. Oh. Rest was the most important thing. How did you ever happen to fall off that boat? Fall? Doctor, I was pushed. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cod Harbor, Massachusetts. To the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Boston. Assignment, the Meg's Palace Matter. Report and expense account continued. As soon as I hung up on Dr. Champion, I again checked the splint on my right leg and confirmed the suspicion that I couldn't possibly walk on it. Then, a few minutes later, Meg McCarthy came into my room. She carried a tray filled with enough food to choke a horse. And while I piled into it, she brought me up to date. It's in Barnesboro that Dr. Champion has his office. And lucky it was for you, he happened to be here in Cod Harbor on his weekly visit. Oh, you were a sorry-looking mess when the men brought you in. Yesterday, the doctor said. You've been out as cold as a codfish ever since. But he can tell by the looks that the rest has done a lot for you. How do you feel? No matter of fact, Meg, I feel pretty... Oh, well, pretty good. There, you see, you've got to take it easy, like the doctor said. Just lay there and rest and sleep and eat all the good food I bring you. Yeah, except and unless I get up and going on this case. You'll try that and I'll lash you to the bedpost. Doctor's orders is doctor's orders, so don't you try nothing different. Yes, ma'am. Oh, it's a miracle, praise be, that that propeller on the Lily Ann didn't cut you to ribbons. Captain Billy and his crew brought me back here, huh? Who else? Where are they now? Fishing out on the banks, of course. What did you expect? Don't you know they have to earn a living the same as me and you? And what about keeping up the payments on that seagoing bathtub? Precious little time they had for fishing yesterday after that fool trick you pulled falling off of her. Is that what they told you happened? Of course. What else? Meg, which of the men told you I'd fallen off the boat? Well, all of them. Only the first mate, young Charlie Montgomery, the engineer, and, of course, my willy by himself, Captain Morgan, to you. And they all told it the same way? What? Why not? Should they be after making up fairy tales? How did they tell it? You're sure that screw didn't hit you on the head, too? You lost your memory? How did they tell it, Meg? It's important. Well, whilst they went about their chores, you were standing alone up in the bows. Then they heard you yell. Yeah? Despite of the darkness, they seen you splash in the phosphorescent wake. And there you were, being sucked under by the prop. That's all. And they all told it the same? Exactly the same. Even young Charlie Buttons kept saying it over and over. I saw it, I saw it all. Oh. Like, well, you know, like he was still struck with the fear of what might have happened to you. I wonder. Well, stop wondering and get yourself some more sleep or the doctor will have me head. And if he does, I'll take it out on you. And believe me, Johnny boy, that will be a lot worse than the fool accident of yours ever was. Meg, listen <laughs> to me. It was no accident. What? I was thrown overboard. Oh. Johnny, boy, you're raving delirious out of your head. I was leaning over the rail, watching the water, and a powerful pair of arms belonging to somebody aboard that boat picked me up and tossed me over. Saints, who? Ole Jensen, young Charlie Buttons, Montgomery, or Captain Billy himself. You start raving, Johnny. You must have got hit on the head. And I'll bet my last buck that whoever did it is the same one who slugged me in the alley, the same one who threatened to burn you out of this place he Oh, was. no, And the minute Johnny. I get up out of this bed, I... Tell me something. Yes? Tim Beasley, your police chief and mayor and so on. Yes? Has he been up here to see you? That good for nothing, brother Sky to know. And what's more, if he shows his ugly face in my establishment, I'll toss him out on his beam ends. But why do you ask? Because I told him to get the threatening notes from you. Check them against the handwriting of several people here in Cod Harbor. Who? Like that sniveling cousin of his, Clem Harris, that runs the Silver Plate Cafe? Yeah, among others. Well, he ain't been here. And I won't have him here. I take it you and he don't get along. Of course we don't. Why? Because ever since his cousin Clem has been in business, Tim has threatened to close me up. For what reason? For breaking town ordinances on restaurants. The kind he enforces over to Barnesboro. Well, have you been breaking them? No more than no less than dear cousin Clem or Tony Fortino or Ernie Turner does after their harsh joints. But me, he always is picking on, and why? Because I get most of the business from the fishermen. So you want a suspect in this case, Johnny boy? 
You've named them for me, Meg. The other cafe owners. All right, so I'll give you one. Tim Beasley and Clem Harris working in cahoots. And if it wasn't one of them, way lady in the eye. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Neither of them could have been aboard the Lily Ann. Then you must have fell. Oh, Meg, when is the doctor coming to see me? Mm, he should be here by now. Well, if he doesn't come pretty soon, I'm getting up and going, orders or no orders. Johnny? Motives, suspects. Why, Meg McCarthy herself could have rigged this whole thing. Called me in as a cover-up while she burned up her place to collect 15000 insurance. Even her intended, Captain Billy Morgan, who'd collect her life insurance if she were to die in a fire. Tim Beasley, lazy slob of a general factotum in Cod Harbor, to put Meg's palace out of business on behalf of his cousin, Clem Harris. Or Clem himself. Or one of Captain Billy's crew, for some reason I hadn't yet fathomed. Half an hour later, Dr. Champion arrived, looked me over, and then went to work with a pair of bandage shears. So, no, we'll take off that splint. Oh, but if something's broken, Doc. <laughs> Not a thing broken, Mr. Dollar. Just an old trick of mine. Huh? You needed absolute rest until I could see you again. And from what I've heard about you, you wouldn't have taken it unless I fooled you into it. And that was the sole reason for the splint. <laughs> Doc, you're a wonder. <laughs> there we are. And in view of your surprisingly good condition, I'd say you may be up and around as soon as you honestly feel able. Say, even tomorrow, perhaps. Item eight, ten dollars for medical services. All that Dr. Champion would accept. Needless to say, as soon as he left, I planned to get up and get to work. But as he walked out the door, Meg brought Captain Billy in to visit and sympathize. So, in hope of keeping him off guard, I played real sick. Then only a Montgomery came in, too. But I needed to get these men alone, and I must admit, be feeling better than I did. And then I realized that young Charlie hadn't come. I asked about him. Mr. Burnsboro, Johnny, said as long as the doctor was keeping you in bed two or three days, he could see you when he gets back. But wait a minute. Uh, he went to pick up some supplies for Meg here like he always does. Uh, gives him a chance to drop in on his sister where he keeps his Sunday clothes and things. He wasn't out on the boat with you today? Ah, Meg spoils a lad that way. Always has him going in for supplies when I need him the uh, most. Look here now, Willie boy. You talk like I was the one picked today. Well, of for course him. you did. Of you course always do. I didn't, and don't you tell me. He said it was you. Yeah, you're off your course, to... Mr. Oh, Carthy. Yeah, you know blasted and well don't you are. shake your finger at me, you blue nose. You're a pipe down, down woman. Do you want Mr. Down, Dollar to have a relapse? You... Oh, Johnny boy. I'm sorry. Shut up, Bill. Ha! <laughs> it's okay, Maggie. And but tell me that... I'm sorry if I seem to be raising my voice at you. Oh, bless you, Meg. It's that fiery spirit that keeps me loving you. Yeah, but now, uh, why don't we leave the poor man alone to recover, huh? Come on, boy. Yes, come on, all of you. Out you go. After you, Meg. Oh, After my, you. how polite we are. Montgomery, wait. Oh, Mr. Dollar, something I can do for you to ease your bed of pain. A little drink or something? Of a bottle aboard the Lily Ann? No, no, thanks. I want to talk to you about Charlie. A real fine lad he is. Now, I'm sure he'd be wanting to see you when he gets back from his visit in town. No, no, wait. Uh, Captain Morgan said he has a sister in Barnesboro. Do you know the address? Oh, that I do. <laughs> Many's a fine meal we've had from her on our time off. Well, I want to see her. You know, just a little personal thing. Oh, then here, I'll write down the address for you. She lives in a pretty little ass on the corner of Rose Island. <laughs> Maybe Montgomery was the wrong one to ask, I don't know. But I had to gamble somewhere along the line. And if my suspicions about Charlie Buttons was right, I hoped I wouldn't be too late. When Montgomery had left, I sneaked out the back door to avoid Meg and hurried over to Tim Beasley's office in the shack that functioned as Cod Harbor City Hall. He wasn't there. A woman who lived next door informed me he'd taken off in a hurry to Barnesboro. So Beasley had gone to town after Charlie. Or had he? For twenty-five dollars, that's item nine. I rented a creaky old truck and headed for Barnesville. Charlie's sister's house was on a gravel road out on the edge of town. There was no other car there, so I stopped in front of the place, got out, and walked up to the front door. Sorry, mister, but my sister... Mr. Dollar. Hello, Charlie. Yeah, I... I meant to say, why didn't you come in? Sure glad to see you're all right, Mr. Dollar. Are you? 
That sure was awful. You, you're falling off the boat that way. What's the matter, Charlie? Aren't you feeling good? Yes, yeah, sure. Sure I am. You look a little pale. And say... Well, well. Packing up to leave, huh? Yeah, I... Well, I'm tired of the fishing business, Mr. Dollar. Going to give it up. Go somewhere else during a living. Tired of it, yeah. Why did you do it, Charlie? Huh? I, I don't know what you mean. It took somebody who knew that boat pretty well to sneak up on me in the dark and push me overboard. It took a strong, young pair of arms to do it, too. Yours, weren't they? Well? I didn't want to do it, Mr. Dollar. So help me, I didn't want to. But he made me. Yeah? Who made you? He found out. He, he found out about me, about my record. What record? That... That I'd killed a man once, accidentally, when I was just a kid. And I'd run out and escape from the reformatory. But now I'm grown. If they ever catch me, they'll hang me or the electric chair up for life. And he knew that. Charlie. If I didn't do anything he said, like slugging you or trying to start the fires or anything, he'd give me away. So I had to, don't you see? I couldn't help myself. He made me do everything. Charlie, who, Charlie, who? It's all right. You don't need to rough me up, Dollar. I knew I'd get caught up with someday. I'll go quiet with you. And maybe, maybe you'll help to, to try and get things easy for me. Charlie, huh? who made you try to kill me? Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you. It was so we could get you out of the way and burn up Meg's palace and her with it. I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar, it was... Oh, oh no. Huh? There. At the window. Behind you. That old trick. Oh, no, you... Help! <laughs> The boy fell against me, pinning me to the floor. And as I pushed him away, I saw the patch of red slowly spreading on the front of his shirt directly above the heart. By the time I got to the window, a car had taken off down the old gravel road and was completely obscured by a thick cloud of dust. And I wondered. I wondered for whom the shot that killed Charlie had really been intended. Here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a killer strikes again. But one of his victims rises from the grave to strike back. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Chief Walters, Barnesboro Police. You call me? Oh, yeah, Chief. I understand you're out at Sally Button's place on the edge of town. What can I do for you? Better get out here, Chief, fast. Oh? Yeah, to pick up a body. Tonight... And every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From 
from Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Card Harbor, Massachusetts, to the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Boston. Assignment, the Meg's Palace matter. Report and expense account continued. Whoever shot young Charlie Buttons there at his sister's home in Barnesboro had disappeared down the gravel road in a cloud of dust. Hence the call to the police. Chief Walters was in his late 30s and definitely on the ball. He made a quick call to the coroner, and then in his car, we took off for Cod Harbor. We've pretty much left him alone over there in Cod Harbor, Mr. Dollar, and so far they've always managed to keep the peace. This time... Yeah. Now listen, Chief, and I'll give it to you fast. Yes, do that. Meg McCarthy got some threats to burn her place down, notified the insurance company they sent me out. Understandable. First night there, I spotted a prowler around the cafe, but before I could get to him, somebody slugged me from behind. You didn't know who? Not then, but the prowler turned out to be Tim Beasley, your, well, your deputy over there, I guess you'd call him. Uh, sort of, you know, self-appointed, lazy lot. But didn't he know who slugged you? He said not. It was Meg herself there. She has a powerful right, Dollar. Yeah, I thought of that, too, but let me go on now. The next morning, I went out on the Lily Ann and got tossed overboard. And believe me, Chief, the propeller on one of those boats isn't much fun to tangle with. Yes, Dr. Champion told me he'd had to go over to fix you up. Yeah. Anyhow, I was sure that whoever was after me was a member of that crew. Had to be. I see. When I came to back at Meg's, I had visitors. The crew, loaded with sympathy. The crew, that is, except for Charlie Buttons. And that's why you traced him to his sister's house? Uh Uh-huh. And, Chief, he confessed. Then I don't understand. But he said he was forced to do those things by somebody who knew of his criminal record and was holding it over his head. Criminal record? Charlie Buttons? Yeah, it seems he killed a man once when he was just a kid. The point is, this other person threatened to expose Charlie unless Charlie did his bidding. So Charlie, not being very bright, didn't think he had a chance. You find out who this other person is? No. That's when somebody shoved a gun through the window and back him. He shot him, then took off in the proverbial cloud of dust. Mm. How are you doing on suspects? Oh, brother, too many. Meg, of course, named her rivals in the cafe business right from the beginning. Well, I wouldn't count them very good suspects. Then uh, there's Captain Billy Morgan, her intended husband. <laughs> what a pair. And if I know Captain Billy, he was just scrounging a lot of free meals. Say, incidentally, I saw him in Barnesburg just before you called. Yeah? Well, Captain Billy is beneficiary of Meg's life policy. And he still owes a lot of dough in the Lily Ann, I understand. Hmm. Who else? Tim Beasley. What? Yeah. No. What dollar. I know he's a good-for-nothing bum who has taken that job of acting mayor, acting police chief, acting everything else so he can live off the fat of the land over there. Did you also know that Clem Harris, who runs the other big cafe, is his cousin? His cousin, huh? Oh, and Beasley never kept his promise to dig up the threatening notes Meg received and compare them with the handwriting of the others. Doesn't look good, does it? What do you think, Chief? I'm beginning to wonder if Tim Beasley will be there when we get to Cod Harbor. As it turned out, Tim Beasley was very much in evidence. So was the whole population of Cod Harbor. For as the lights of the little fishing village slowly hove into view, I saw another light down by the waterfront, a rather a big reddish glow. And as we pulled in closer, we could see the long tongues of flame leaping up with it caused it. Yep, Meg's palace was on fire. Chief Walters stepped on it. We took the last few turns on two wheels. Hoses of all sorts and shapes and sizes connected to pumps aboard the nearby fishing boats were throwing powerful streams of water at Meg's palace. At the back, where the fire had apparently started. But the flames continued to spread, even licking along the ground behind the building. That means arson, Johnny. Oil or gasoline spreading around back there. No doubt of it, Chief. Hey, how did it start, Captain Billy? Who knows? But grab a hose and get to work. Get some hose off one of them boats. Crazy Captain Billy Morgan was running the show, and every one of my prized suspects was in there working his head off. All of them taking orders from Captain Billy. And then I realized that Meg McCarthy was nowhere around, and I noticed something else. All the firefighting was directed toward the back of the building. The front, thanks to the wind, was untouched. But that's where Meg McCarthy's room was. Chief! Chief Wallace! Hey, Johnny, where are you going? Come on, Chief, give me a hand. What? See that window up there? Well, I'm going to climb up on the front roof of the place. You'll burn to a crisp up there. Got to take that chance, because I think I can blow this whole case wide open. Now, clench your hands so I can step on them and hoist me up. But even right here, the heat is Come on, too man, quick, come on. Okay, Johnny, but I think you're crazy. Here you are. Now, up. Here you go. The heat was almost unbearable up on that roof. I knew I had to do it. 
I crawled low along the shingles, hoping the rotten old roof would hold. A withering blast that felt like fire itself hit me full in the face as I broke the window of Meg's room. And there she lay, stretched out, unconscious on her bed. There was an ugly, livid mark across her forehead where somebody had struck her down and left her there at the mercy of the fire. Johnny! Valerie, all right? The searing heat seemed to press in on me, engulf me. And the open window gave a draft to the flames that were already licking at the sides of the open door. Somehow I managed to wrap a blanket around Meg, covering her face and staggered to the window, blindly groping for it. Johnny! This way, the window! Keep that hose on us here! All right, Johnny. You're all right now, I got you. It's all right, boy. It's all right. It's all right, Johnny boy. Outside of having your hair singed and losing a suit of clothes, you're all okay. Well, thank goodness you are, Meg. But tell me... Ooh. Oh, now take it easy. You've got a bad burn on that left arm and you've got to lie still. Yeah, and would Meg... you believe it, it was Clem Harris, the one I always thought was such an old good blather skite that'd give us each a place to stay here at this house. I wondered where I was when I came to a few minutes ago. I guess I misjudged the man. But how about you, Meg? Oh, bless you, darling. You saved me life, and I'll never forget it. May the good Lord strike me down. If it hadn't have been for you. Oh, think of it, Johnny. Boy, I'd be laying still in that pile of ashes out there that was once to me a nice cafe. I love you, Johnny. Boy, and I'm humble and I'm grateful. Meg, that mark on your head. Oh, the dirty, blathering spalpeen who snuck up in me room and knocked me down and left me there. I'll murderize him when I find him, that dirty cunning. You don't know who it was? How could I when he snuck up from behind me? Oh, Chief Walters, come in, sir, come in. Well, I must say, you two look pretty good, considering. Ready for a visitor, Johnny? Yeah, hi, Chief. Bring him in. Oh, now, Johnny, are you sure you want visitors until you're feeling better? Bring him in, boys. Right in here. Come on. All right, uh, stop your push-ups. Come on, Gilly. Oh, Billy boy. Oh, what's the matter with you, Willie? That look on your face. Oh, and you, Chief Waters. What was the idea of locking up my Willie boy like some dirty scoundrel of a crook when he tried so hard to save my cafe from that awful fire? Who do you think you All are? All right, Meg, simmer down. Don't simmer you talk down. to me like that, you young Meg. whisker snap. Yes, darling. Well, I won't simmer down. What was the big idea arresting me that way? Who do you think you are around here? And I'm talking to you, Dollar. You went too far, Captain Billy. I went too far. You're off your course. What are you talking about? Yes, Johnny boy, if you was responsible... Quiet, Meg. Uh, Yes, sir. I'm talking about arson, Captain Billy. And murder. And the motives behind them. What? Motives. They were all over the place by half a dozen people. But yours was the strongest. By far. You're off your head. The 25,000 insurance on Meg's life. That was the Why, you... One. Let me out of... No, just a minute. You take oh, your hand off Take it easy, Meg, or I'll have to order you out. But listen to what he's saying. Is that Captain Billy was... Quiet, quiet. Yeah, let me finish this, will you, Meg? Played lover boy to her, didn't you, Captain Billy? To make sure you'd be her beneficiary. You're crazy. That's You're dirty. Right. It looked like you right from the first, but I couldn't be sure until I compared the writing on the threatening letters with some of your handwriting I found. Oh, no. So that's the way you found out, you dirty underhanded. Oh, yeah, know. Captain, that's right. Threatening letters. To make it look like somebody else was out to get her. Her competitors, for instance. And to leave the way clear for you. Willie Bull. No, no, I didn't. I, I mean, I didn't mean to. But... Oh, no, Willie. Tell me it ain't true. Don't touch me. Oh. Why, Billy? Why'd you do it? I had to. I had to have the money or I'd lose my... What? Boat. You mean your boat was more to you Go than... on, Billy, and quiet, Mag. Fishing. Fishing was my whole life. I had to save my boat. I had to get the money for it. How else could you I ever... You rotten... No, 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 I don't know, Johnny boy. Maybe I'll move to someplace else and open up. I wouldn't have the heart to here. Cod Harbor, it'd be too. It was here that I met him and I believed him. And 
Well, I guess this old heart of mine wasn't as tough as I thought it was. Yeah. I'm sorry, Meg. I'll get over it. Sure I will. Meg McCarthy, Johnny Dollar. No blather and idiot of a man is going to keep Meg McCarthy down. That's the You story. hear me? No man on this whole earth is worth it. They're all of them just a bunch of no good too tight. Oh, no. No, Johnny boy, not you. If only there was more of the likes of you in the world. I love you, Johnny boy. And if I were a bit younger and maybe pretty... Johnny. Yeah? Now tell me, where did you ever get the threat letters you compared the writing of? I'd have swore that I destroyed them, every one. <laughs> no, something, Meg. I didn't. Huh? I never saw them. Never saw a sample of Captain Billy Morgan's writing either. You mean you... Oh, no. Huh? Well, it worked, didn't it? Aye. And it serves that conniving murder and blather scorching... Johnny, I'm afraid I really did love him. <laughs> yeah, it had been a long shot, and thank goodness it had paid off. The courts will take care of Captain Billy. The insurance on her place, of course, will have to be paid to Bank McCarthy, but no life insurance, thank heaven. Oh, poor Meg. It'll be a long, long time before she'll fall for sweet talk again. Expense account totaled, including fare and incidentals, back to Hartford, 22160. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week? Well, they say that diamonds are a girl's best friend. But I wonder when they're a motive for murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jack Crucian, Byron Kane, Forrest Lewis, Burt Holland, Stan Jones, Bob Bruce, Austin Green, and Harry Bartell. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino and Carl Fortina. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> 